Thank you very much. Um, sorry about this slow start, but uh, don't speed up. Yeah. Of time. Right. So <laughs> we'll just shorten the break. It's fine. So um, I will talk about uh, a bunch of problems concerned with the analysis of mixing time um, of Markov chains associated to some polymer models that uh, have some, uh, some uh, interest in uh, models of statistical physics. <coughs> and uh, we will see that a basic polymer model analysis can be, can be used as a building block for uh, more sophisticated structures like, like uh, lattice dimers and uh, um, other combinatorial structure that have some interest in statistical physics, such as interface models in uh, Easing uh, interface um, models for easing um, uh, phase separation and things like that. So I will try to be uh, as slow as possible and as elementary as possible, as, especially in the first half of the talk. So this should really be um, the hope is that we can all follow the details of uh, some proofs also in the first half. That the second half will be more about how to use this kind of ideas to get to some more sophisticated models. And that, uh, in that part, I will not do proofs, actually. But hopefully, there will be enough um, material to, to communicate the main ideas. So can you all read? Uh, should I turn the light down, or is it good? OK. OK, so let's start with the, the basic uh, uh, object that we will look at, and namely uh, the set of uh, lattice paths from uh, 0 to uh, 0 after L steps. So these are, uh, these are paths that take uh, each, each step is plus or minus 1. And we go from 0 to 0 in L steps. So L is an, int is a, is an even number. <coughs> and uh, we consider the set omega L of all such objects. And it's, it's, of course, elementary that there's a L over L choose two such uh, objects. And we consider the, the equilibrium measure, namely the uniform measure over all uh, such uh, configurations. OK, so this is what I will call the free polymer, just to have some, some fancy name. Um, Another basic model we will look at is the, the polymer on the wall. Namely, I put uh, a constraint that the polymer is above a given uh, substrate. So just call it a wall and say that the polymer is on the wall when it is constrained to be non-negative. So the set of all these uh, objects is omega L plus, is, is also called the set of Dick, Dick paths. And the number of them, uh, the cardinality of that set is the Catalan number of index L over 2. So the equilibrium measure will be uniform over all such objects. So I want to now uh, describe um, a uh, natural Markov chain for these objects and uh, try to analyze mixing times. So these things are well known, but uh, we, we want to learn slowly from the basic uh, the basic stuff before we get to some more complicated objects. So let's start with the, the Markov chain. In, in discrete time, this Markov chain is, um, is um, described as follows. Pick, pick a, a, a site x inside your interval at random, uniformly at random, and try to uh, modify locally your polymer at that x. So all you could do is uh, switch a mountain into a valley locally or, or vice versa. So if, if, the, if the polymer is flat at that point, you, there's nothing you can do. If you have a, a mountain or a valley, you can uh, switch that with probability a half uh, you put uh, a mountain and with probability a half you put a valley. So, so this, is the, this describes the Markov chain uh, you can do. And this Markov chain is symmetric. So in particular, it is reversible with respect to our equilibrium measure, which is uniform. Okay? So 
This defines, uh, uh, this can be defined, uh, of course, also in the model with the wall, where, where your uh, configuration is constrained to be non-negative. Just uh, reject attempts to go below the wall. Okay? If you, if you give zero probability to the transition that bring the polymer below the wall, this, this gives, again, a uh, symmetric transition kernel. Let's call it uh, K. In both cases, this defines a symmetric transition kernel, K eta eta prime. These are two polymer configurations. And uh, in particular, it is reversible with respect to the uh, uniform measure. It is also irreducible. This is easy to see. Consider the case without the wall. So there is a, a maximal configuration, namely the one where you go as high as possible all the way up. And then you have, you're forced to come down to L. So this is a maximal configuration. And there is also a minimal configuration, the symmetric one. And you can uh, easily see that this move can bring you to, from one to the other. And, and so you cover all the state space by, so it's irreducible. Uh, OK? So now I'm, I want to use, uh, instead of this uh, discrete time Markov chain, I want to use a continuous time Markov chain. And uh, let me describe this. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I guess some of you may not be familiar with continuous time Markov chains. But, but this is a simple object here. Um, in this case, it is, it is very simple to describe it. So uh, a, a, a practical way to implement this is to assign to each side x inside your interval a, <coughs> a Poisson clock with rate one. That means I have a Poisson process with rate one at each site x, and they're all independent. And uh, at the arrival times of these Poisson uh, processes. This is just half oh. the job. It's only the laser. It doesn't pass OK, the excellent. Slides. Excellent. That's Thanks. Oh, okay. That's very good. Thank you. So we have uh, at each site x, we have independent Poisson processes with rate one. So at, at each arrival time of these Poisson processes, we, uh, we update our configuration at x. So the height of the polymer at x will be updated. And the rule is always the same. So just put plus minus 1 the, the, the value of the neighbors with probability 1 half, 1 half. OK? So this, this is a practical way to construct the random variables at time t. And that defines our continuous time Poisson process. And uh, again, in the model with the wall, you just do the same thing, but reject the moves that bring you below the wall. Let's use uh, the notation here uh, will be the following. So if I start with an initial condition sigma times 0, I will call eta sigma t the configuration of the polymer at time t. And uh, I will use this notation, PTF of sigma is the expected value starting with configuration sigma of an observable f of a function f on the configuration at time t. OK? This is standard notation for continuous time uh, Markov chains. What is important here is that uh, it is immediate to construct a global coupling, namely, a, um, we can realize all the evolutions of these objects starting from all possible initial configurations on the same probability space. And we can uh, do that in the obvious way, namely use exactly the same Poisson clocks for everybody and uh, use the same moves when, when the two neighboring uh, vertices are the same, use the same moves for, uh, for everybody. And uh, when they're not the same, you can, you can just uh, couple them in a, 
in an arbitrary way and it will, it will be fine. And uh, the global coupling is important. Uh, this, this construction has an important property that is monotonicity here. Namely, that if you start from uh, a configuration, an initial configuration that is uh, higher everywhere, higher than another initial uh, configuration, the two evolutions will be uh, ordered in the same way as the starting um, configuration for all times. In particular, I'm interested in following the evolution of the maximal configuration. So let's remember this maximal configuration. I will indicate it as uh, this uh, wedge symbol. This is the maximal configuration. And uh, the, this V symbol is, is uh, the minimal configuration, so the, the bottom configuration. And so by the monotonicity, it's clear that any configuration will, will at any time t, the evolution of any configuration sigma will, will be sandwiched between the, the two evolution of the maximal and the minimal configuration. Okay. So this is uh, the construction of uh, the process. I also want uh, uh, to use a bit of analytical uh, uh, tools. Something is happening. Pretty good. <laughs> so I also want to use a bit of calculus here. So let's introduce the generator. In this setting, if you've never seen uh, infinitesimal generator of Markov chains, uh, let's, let's just uh, write it in this way. So we have the discrete kernel k. Take k minus identity. This gives uh, a, a new matrix, if you want. And uh, just multiply it by L minus 1. This is a scaling. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's only going to give an overall uh, scaling factor. So this is our generator. It's, it's a matrix. And uh, it's important. It's important to. Sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. It forgot about. The okay. Good. So uh, in this setting, we have uh, we have the following uh, uh, description of the matrix L. So this can be seen as an operator acting on functions f on the state space, and. If you remember the shape of our uh, discrete time kernel, this, is, this can be written now in the following way. Because the discrete time kernel is just uh, choosing an x at random and then uh, putting, uh, if, if the two values are the same, you put one half, one half. So what you're doing is really is you're putting a local equilibrium, a sample from, a local, from the local equilibrium given the neighbors. This is one way to describe this one half, one half uh, procedure. So if I introduce conditional expectation given the neighbors, you see this, this QXF is a conditional expectation of a function F given all the neighbors of the site X. Okay. So this amounts to make a sample of uh, the height at X given the neighbors um, of X. So the generator, which has this shape here, can be written simply in this form because the L minus 1 uh, factor just removes the, the 1 over L minus 1 from the uniform uh, choice of the site to be updated. And so I can write this in this form. Reversibility just means that L is a symmetric matrix. So I can take uh, PT, the exponential of TL, OK? And this is also a symmetric matrix. And PT, if you think about it uh, for a moment, is nothing else but the transition probability after uh, a time t. So if I write PT sigma xi, this is simply the probability that in time t, you go from configuration sigma to configuration xi. And uh, it is reversible, again, because of symmetry. Then this PT converges to the uniform measure, as we know, as time uh, t goes to infinity. And uh, one object that we have seen already in Yuval's talk is the Dirichlet form. It can be written in this way uh, here. It's just the quadratic form of the operator minus L. So quadratic form in L2 of, of the 
of the equilibrium measure mu. So it has an explicit expression in these terms here. OK. Um, let's go a few steps ahead. Then an important uh, quantity to study relaxation to equilibrium is when, when, you want to, when you want to understand the speed of this convergence here. A, 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 an important quantity, one of the first things you, you want to look at is the spectral gap. Spectral gap is just the, the first non-zero eigenvalue of this operator minus L. This is a self-adjoint operator because of symmetry here. So you have real eigenvalues, and the first non-zero eigenvalues, we call it a uh, gap. And this, by variational principle, can be written as a uh, infimum over the ratio of Dirichlet form over variance of f with respect to the equilibrium measure. Another quantity that we have seen uh, over and over is the mixing time, namely the first time t such that the worst initial condition has total variation at time t with respect to the equilibrium less equal than a fourth, okay? And spectral gap and mixing time uh, satisfy some standard relations that uh, essentially mixing time is bounded uh, from below by the inverse of the spectral gap and is bounded from above by the inverse of, its, of the spectral gap times some uh, factor that takes into account the, the smallest probability in your state space, mu star, and uh, you take the log of 1 over mu star. In our setting, mu star is an exponential of L, essentially, so the log will be a constant times L. So when you do these bounds, you may, you may have a, a loss of a factor L here. Inverse of the spectral gap is what uh, often is called the relaxation time. So maybe before I move on, I, I, I want to make sure that we're all on the same, uh, uh, we, we all understand this, this basic uh, of, uh, uh, of the continuous time Markov chain. If, if there are questions, please stop me then. OK, so we can move on. The first thing I want to do is uh, show you a, a very nice uh, and very simple argument to prove that the mixing time of, the, of this object, both, both for the free polymer and for the polymer on the wall, satisfies these bounds. So mixing time is bounded below by constant time L squared log L, and is bounded above by constant time L squared log L. And, uh, some of you may have seen these bounds with uh, L cube log L instead of L square log L, but that's because of the discrete time, continuous time uh, uh, difference. So with continuous time scaling, with continuous time uh, uh, model, you, you have this type of scaling. It's, there's a factor L difference. And um, in, in all this talk, I will not be interested in precise constants here. So, so we can do, we can be quite rough about the constants here. And uh, I, 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 will, I will do this uh, theorem in, in detail so we can, we can all um, follow all the details of the proof. But um, let me say that a bit of history of this thing. So concerning the free polymer, namely without the wall, this, this had been looked at already uh, in the 80s, and I think the, the upper bound was already derived in, uh, in, uh, by Aldous. And the lower bound was conjecture uh, to hold with the L square log L, I think by Aldous and Percy. There, 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 have been, there has been uh, quite some work on this where uh, they, they could show L square instead of L square log L, as it was uh, already um, um, told by um, Johan in Johan's talks. Um, and then it was first proved, I think, by Wilson. And uh, recently, as also was reminded uh, in Johan's talks, 
there has been a, a much finer analysis by Hubert Lacroix, who proved uh, uh, the, the sharp constant here, namely asymptotic uh, with the precise constant, and even gave uh, a cutoff result for, for the thing. So if you don't know what that is, don't, don't worry about it. We, we will just focus on uh, a, a simple proof of this thing. And for this, we will follow uh, quite closely, uh, very closely, the argument of Wilson in Wilson's paper. And um, what is nice is the way I will formulate the, the proof is going to be um, somehow robust, and it will also allow us to prove the same result with the wall, which was not analyzed before, but it's, it's, it's not complicated, as you will see. And what is even more interesting is that the same approach will allow us to prove uh, results for uh, a more sophisticated settings where you add uh, some, some interactions and some other uh, features to the model. So one can still use the same argument both for lower bound and upper bound. This is the nice thing that it, the proof is quite, uh, OK? The same argument actually allows you to compute the spectral gap. This could be done in, in other ways. Uh, there, there's also other ways to compute the spectral gap. But, but it's nice that it's uh, one of the uh, byproducts of this argument that you can actually compute the spectral gap in the free polymer. And you can give. Uh, uh, up to constant, tight bounds up to constant for the spectral gap, even with the wall. Okay? Good. So I can start the argument. So let's give a full proof of the upper bound. So recall that uh, total variation distance can be um, upper bounded by uh, a coupling of the two random variables associated. Uh, to the two distributions you want to compute the distance. So one thing I can do here is I want to couple the distribution at time t started from xi to the distribution uh, at equilibrium. So distribution at equilibrium is, is, uh, can, can be seen as distribution at time t when you start at equilibrium. And uh, by the monotonicity, I know that if the maximal and the minimal configuration have coupled by time t, then everybody has coupled. All the other configurations have coupled. So having uh, no coupling at time t for these two configurations, in particular, implies that there is no coupling at time t for the maximal and the minimal configuration. That's, that's a, a good uh, thing about coupling and monotonicity that we can use here. Then uh, consider a function that is uh, written in this way. Phi t is the sum over x in the internal uh, sites of some weights gx. These are some positive weights gx. And then just compare the, uh, just compute the, the height difference at time t between the maximal configuration at x and the minimal configuration at x. Okay. Now, uh, by monotonicity, phi t is positive, is non negative. And uh, if there is a difference, if there is no coupling at time t between the, the maximal and minimal configuration, then phi t is at least as large as twice the minimum value of g. Because the difference between these two is either 0 or 2 or, or higher. So if, if the distance is not 0, this has to be at least 2. And there is a minimal weight g, g min, that uh, comes in. So having no coupling implies phi t is larger than 2 g min. So you can use Markov's inequality and say that uh, probability of no coupling at time t is bounded by expected value of phi t divided by 2 g min. So what we have to do now is compute the expected value of phi t. And uh, there is, uh, we are in a lucky situation where this can be computed exactly if you choose properly the weights g, gx. Let's, let's do this observation, which is crucial here. Look at the action of our operator L, the generator, on the variable uh, that associates 
to the polymer eta associates the height eta x. Okay? So what is the effect of the generator on eta x? If you, if you remember what, uh, what the generator is, it's just taking locally the, the expected value according to the equilibrium measure. So if, if the two uh, neighbors are at the same height, I will just do the value of the neighbors plus one or minus one with probability a half. And uh, this gives exactly this expression here. Namely, when I take uh, the expected value, what I will get is just the value of the right neighbor plus the value of the left neighbor divided by two. <coughs> This minus 2 eta x with 1 half is just minus eta x, which is coming from the fact that you are subtracting the identity uh, in, the, in the generator. So, so it is an immediate uh, consequence of our definition that you can write the action of L eta x as the discrete Laplacian on eta computed at the site x. Okay? So, um, when I apply this to the linear function uh, obtained by summing over x, all gx eta x, I obtain this simple expression, gx uh, Laplacian here, summing by parts now, which I can do because I take g0 equal to gl equal to 0, and uh, my eta also has zero boundary condition, so there is no boundary term, I, I get uh, summing by parts, I, get, I, I can bring the Laplacian on G. And now if I choose G as uh, this function here, namely an eigenfunction of the discrete Laplace operator, I get uh, that delta G is equal to minus kappa L G, where GX is sine of pi X over L, and kappa L is 1 minus cosine of uh, pi over L. So we have found an eigenfunction of the generator L by, by using capital F for this uh, linear function here. So this L capital F is minus kappa L capital F. This is an eigenfunction of the thing. And we want to use it to compute the expected value of phi t here. And this is now simple because if you compute the derivative of expected value of phi t, by uh, remember that, that the semigroup is just the exponential of TL. So it's a simple calculus here to show that when you compute the derivative of exponential phi t, of the expectation of phi t, you get the expected value of LF computed on the maximal evolution at time t minus LF computed on the minimal evolution at time t. And uh, this is nothing else but minus kappa L of expected value of phi t. Okay. So this allows us to compute the, the expected value of phi t because we have a, a, a simple differential equation here. And so we have expectation of phi t is just equal to the initial value phi zero, e minus kappa l t. Then uh, the total variation distance from, from some initial condition C, arbitrary, is upper bounded by phi zero e minus kappa LT divided by two G min. Now you do uh, some uh, simple uh, manipulation. You observe that G min is uh, at least one over L up to constants. Phi zero is at most L squared up to constants because at most you can get the, the the area under your maximal configuration. And the kappa L is, behaves like 1 over L squared up to constant. So this is immediate to get that if you take T constant L squared times log L, this quantity is all smaller than some, some uh, say, 1 fourth. OK, so that G min is sine of pi over L. So just, uh, yeah. You, yeah. <laughs> so, 
So that gives the upper bound on the mixing time. And uh, it's essentially a Wilson argument. He used it for the discrete time chain. And he, he even uh, optimized all the constants. So he got, uh, he got some, some, uh, some meaningful value for C, which is not the optimal one. With this argument, you do not get the optimal value of C. <coughs> But you can get uh, something that is off maybe by a factor three or four, I don't remember, from the optimal value. What is interesting, though, is that you do get the optimal value for the spectral gap, because the spectral gap is associated only with the exponential decay here. And uh, this is exact. Actually, we, we have found an eigenfunction of the generator with that eigenvalue, so it can only be uh, the spectral gap now. OK, so that's, up, that's the upper bound. What is interesting to observe is that the same bound holds for the polymer with the wall, provided we show we cannot hope to get exactly the same uh, differential equation here. Because that function we found will not be an exact eigenfunction if you have a wall. Because the wall introduces some, some, uh, some uh, it breaks some symmetries. You cannot ho hope for that. Uh. So, you can still hope to get the same quantity as an upper bound. So you, your hope is to prove that e phi t is less equal than phi 0 e minus kappa l t. Because if you get an upper bound here, you, you can repeat the argument. Is, there is no difference. So let's see how you can do that. Well, of course, you, if you prove this, you're all set. If you prove that you have this differential inequality, you get an upper bound here. Uh, for your expected value of, at phi t. So let's try to prove this. This is not hard, actually. You just write down what it means. And let's see. So now, since you have a wall, when you compute the, the action of the generator on eta x, you get the Lapla discrete Laplacian uh, part, but you also get some extra term here, which is a repulsive term when you hit the wall, namely, when, when is it that you're going to fill the wall? Just when your two neighbors are both at 0. Otherwise, you don't fill the wall. So when your two neighbors are both at 0, you are forced to be at plus 1. Instead, this Laplacian part is, is saying that you, you can flip. So you have to add a term that compensates that. And the compensation is exactly the indicator. It's, it's exactly 1 in that case. So, so you just add an indicator that your both neighbors are, are at 0. It's, it's, it's easy to, to, to compute this. It's nothing complicated. OK? OK, so this is a, re, uh, a reflection term, a, a repulsion term. Now you compute uh, the, ex the, the time derivative of your expected value of phi t. And you get, again, this expression here that we had before. But now the L acts in a different way on f. It has this term, which produces the eigenfun as, as if it were an eigenfunction, as before. But then you have another term here. So you have the minus kappa L phi t, expected value of phi t, as before. But, but then these repulsive term produce this, this term here. This term will just be the sum over x, gx, the indicator that your two neighbors are at 0, starting from maximal configuration at time t minus the same term when you start from minimal configuration. It's just uh, because, of, of the, because of the definition of phi t, that's what you get. OK? But now, monotonicity tells you that this expression, point-wise, you don't need to take expectation. Point-wise, this expression is less equal 0. And the reason is that you cannot be anything smaller than 0 in this model because there is a wall. So the minimal configuration is no longer the, the, the minimal uh, uh, well, but it's, it's just the zigzag configuration around 0. So if the maximal configuration has two neighbors at 0, then the same must hold for the minimal configuration. So whenever this, this guy is positive, this guy is also positive. I mean, whenever this is 1, this is 1. So that's less equal 0. So you get this inequality. You plug it in this argument. You get exactly the same upper bound. 
Okay, that's just to, to see how monotonicity and coupling can be very, uh, very simple but very powerful tool to, to get these uh, things. Okay, so now we can do the lower bound. Actually, I will do this uh, very quickly because uh, Johan did this in uh, great, greater detail and I'm not going to spend too much time. It's essentially the same thing that Johan did, except that here we have a different scaling because of continuous time. And we use, uh, and we use calculus instead of uh, discrete uh, uh, difference equations. But it's, it's exactly the same. But very quickly, since I will use it also later, maybe we can sketch uh, uh, the argument. So take f as the function we had before, namely sum over x, gx, eta x, the, the linear function we had before, and compute it on the maximal configuration, on the, max, on the evolution of the maximal configuration at time t. So call ft, so f0 is of order l squared. And now you want to see how this ft is relaxing. You want to use this as a, as an indication of, uh, of uh, being far from equilibrium because you want to say that this FT is, is large for times that are on, on the order of L squared log L. Okay, so as before we have this exact uh, differential equation for the free polymer and uh, some computation that was already done by Johan uh, in his talk will show you that the variance of this FT is is uh, bounded by uh, order L cube for all time t, uniformly in time t. Then uh, you can use this in the following argument. Consider the, the set A, the event A that f is, is uh, just a little bit uh, smaller than L squared, so L, L2 minus epsilon. And uh, since, since the equilibrium value of f is zero because it's just a linear function and the, the, the free polymer is symmetric, then, um, and use also the fact that uh, the value at equilibrium of the variance is the same as this quantity at time t equal infinity is also bounded by L cube, then you have a simple Chebyshev argument which uh, was already done by uh, Johan. Namely, it, it it shows that the, the probability of A at equilibrium is uh, very large. So one minus mu A is, is very small. All that enters in this argument is the fact that, that the variance of, uh, of F is of order L cube, and there is a gap between L cube and L4, so you can play between these two quantities, okay? So at equilibrium, the, the, the set A is very, very likely. On the other hand, you want to see that at time t, for t of order L squared log L, it's very unlikely to be in the set A. So you do, again, the Chebyshev argument. And uh, you see that since you control very precisely the expected value of Ft, you can choose t, um, you can choose t in such a way that uh, that uh, ft minus expected value of ft larger than uh, than l2 minus epsilon is it implies that you are uh, in inside the set a uh, sorry uh, being in the set a at time t implies that that ft uh, exceeds the um, the expected value by at least l2 minus epsilon because you know exactly the expected value that's the thing you, you know exactly expected value, and if you take t that are a small constant times L squared log L, you see that, uh, that um, this quantity is, uh, satisfies this, and, and again, the same, point, the same argument gives you a small, a small probability. So it's very unlikely for the maximal evolution to enter the set A at time t, whereas it is very likely for the equilibrium to be a time in the setting. So this gives a, a lower bound on the T mix. I went fast because this was already done in Johan's stock. So but I, what I want to stress is that the same argument applies with the wall. Here, the difference is that the equilibrium, uh, the equilibrium value of F, the expected value of F uh, at equilibrium is no longer zero. 
but uh, it's not hard to, uh, to check that it will be of order L3 half. The point is that when you have a wall, you still have uh, root L fluctuations. You don't have a much bigger fluctuation than the standard random walk. And root L fluctuations produce uh, this type of behavior because you're computing essentially the area of, of your path, under your path. So this will be L3 half. Okay. So between L square and L3 half, you have some room here, and, and you can still play the same argument. And uh, the problem is to get this estimate here, because this estimate involved a, a careful computation of the action of generator on F squared. And this cannot be done in the same way with the wall. So you have to play a little bit, so compute exactly what this is, gather all the repulsion terms that you will get. It's, it, it's a bit trickier, but you can still do it, and you will end up with some uh, variance estimate that is of order L7 half. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I, I, I wouldn't know, actually. I, I, I think, uh, in the end, what, what you do to do this is kind of rough, so I would not expect it to be sharp. Yeah. I, it's reasonable, I think, to expect the same behavior as in the free case. Yeah. But this is good enough because you have room. And, but of course, if you want sharp constants, you have to get to the right powers, because these powers here will give you the best constants in this argument. So, of course, if you're, I, I think, uh, I think uh, it's not known in this model the sharp constant. So, it would be good to know. You mean the sharp constant for the initial time? Right, right. Because that's probably even harder than the exponent for the variance. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. This would be a first step. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, are there any questions about this? I, I wanted to give you sort of the full uh, arguments for, 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 the, for this simple case. And, and now I wanted to move to, to a problem where, where we add some potential to these polymers. And uh, so let me, maybe if, if there's any question about these arguments or anything I should. Yeah, it's, it's very, very simple, beautiful. It's a, yeah. So maybe I, I want to keep an eye on yeah, the time. It's, it's, it's been about 43 minutes. It's been 43 minutes? Yeah. OK. So I have to maybe uh, hurry up a little bit. So OK. Have I have 90, and it's all in one, yeah. one slot. Okay. Good. So let's go to the pinning model now. Pinning model is uh, exactly the same model we had before. So take the free polymer here, but now add a potential that, uh, that is written in this form. It, you take a parameter lambda, and, and you take lambda to the power number of zeros of your uh, path. So you want, to, uh, you want to take into account some interaction with the, with the line. So you, you, if lambda is larger than 1, you are favoring uh, paths which have many uh, zeros. If lambda is less than 1, you, are, you, want, to be, you want to have less zeros. If land is one, you get, you're back to the free case here. So this is the equilibrium measure you have now. It's not uniform anymore. It's lambda to the power number of uh, zeros, normalized with the partition functions. OK, so a simple observation is that 2 minus L partition function can be written as an expectation over, over a simple random walk of this uh, potential here, lambda to the power number of zeros of the random walk, and uh, in the indicator of going back to zero at time L. Because remember that we are considering only paths that go back to zero at time L. Maybe I should add uh, a remark about this. Everything we say uh, can be done with, uh, with any endpoint fixed, actually. So it's nothing special about zero. But the results will depend on the endpoint. Namely, the mixing time can be uh, uh, depends on the endpoint. End yeah. yeah, and uh, yeah, this is natural because if you take a, an extremely large endpoint, like uh, say the 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 almost maximal endpoint, 
Okay, not not the maximal because that's trivial, but just take the almost maximal. Then you only have one one degree of free, one one uh, one point where you can change the polymer. So that's like a simple random walk, and that should not have the mixing time L square log L, but just L square. Okay, so so you interpolate between this uh, simple random walk. But okay, so I I will stick to height zero and the endpoint and. Okay, so the, the statistical uh, physics of this model is well understood. It's well studied and uh, if, since the 60s people have looked at this and they have studied all kinds of behavior and everything is known. In particular, if you, if you want to compute the free energy of this model, that means you're taking one over a log of the uh, partition function essentially with two minus L. Then you can compute the free energy and you find that if lambda is larger than one, you get something that is um, strictly positive. If lambda is less equal one, you get zero. This is uh, an instance of a phase transition. It's called the localization delocalization transition with critical parameter lambda equal one. And the point is that localization uh, here means that if you're favoring, as soon as you favor uh, paths with, with many zeros, you do get many zeros. That's, that's the message here. And you get a density of zeros, actually. Of course, the free random walk path does not have a density of zeros. But the, the pinned random walk path, namely when you, when you put lambda larger than 1, you get a, a positive density of zeros here. And that's, that's uh, something that, uh, that has been uh, studied in details. Uh, you can study the fluctuations of this. So you will get the usual diffusive fluctuations for lambda less equal one and order one fluctuation if lambda is larger than one. So it's really a localized path. This is uh, well studied. There is a nice uh, review paper by Michael Fisher in the 80s. Then there have been uh, more papers in the mathematical literature uh, dealing with uh, more and more sophisticated uh, versions of these model generalizations and so on. A nice place to look at is uh, Giambattista Giacomin's book um, in 2007 that has a, uh, a, a big review of all these polymer models in terms of equilibrium. So, so far everything that, that uh, we have seen here is only about the equilibrium. So l let's ask what happens in the dynamics and what you want to understand in the dynamics is, uh, as usual, in this uh, statistical uh, physics models, you want to understand what is the, the um, effect of the phase transition on the, on the behavior of relaxation to equilibrium. So a general paradigm that was emphasized already in this uh, workshop that is something that, that is sort of important in this whole uh, mixing uh, Markov chains um, uh, realm is that the general paradigm is that when you have a phase transition, you expect a sharp, um, a dramatic change in the relaxation times. So, so you want to detect this, this uh, dramatic change in relaxation time. And the way you, you do it is by looking at, uh, one way to do it is by looking at the size of mixing times uh, as your system grows and see if the order of, uh, of growth of this mixing time is uh, changing when you cross the critical point. So again, the Markov chain is again the same. I will not repeat things. I just whenever you want to update a vertex uh, x, now the only thing you have to be careful about is when your two neighbors are at plus 1 or minus 1. Because now you want to put the right uh, uh, probabilities. Since you have um, this lambda, you will have probability lambda over 1 plus lambda to, to go from minus 2 to 0. Sorry, to put a 0 if your two neighbors are minus 1. And 1 over 1 plus lambda to put minus 2 if your two neighbors are minus 1. You're doing Glauber dynamics now? Yes, so, so this is uh, Glauber dynamics or heat bath. or So what I want to use is always the, the, the fact that Locally, you're sampling from uh, local equilibrium condition on your two neighbors. So that's the rule. And this is what local equilibrium will give you. OK, any questions about the formulation of the dynamics? Good, so I will, 
I will go fast here because everything is exactly the same. As we said, we have local equilibrium representation. So the generator is, again, exactly the same generator as before. The only thing that changes here is the mu. The mu now has the lambda. So the lambda will come into the game. And the, the construction here automatically ensures that you have uh, reversibility. Now your, your uh, generator and your semigroup are no longer symmetric, but they are reversible with respect to equilibrium. Okay? So spectral gap is, uh, and, and mixing times are defined in the same way. Monotonicity and global coupling apply in the same way, so there is nothing uh, new here. And uh, let, me, let me give you uh, some results and some conjectures ab uh, about this problem, because as you will see, <coughs> not everything is, is completely clear here. So there is some, something to be understood. And so this is a source of uh, a lot of open problems if you want uh, to, to take something that is you know, simple to start with, but it gets quite complicated uh, quickly. So let's, let's think, uh, recall that for lambda equal 1, the free case has a uh, gap of order 1 over L squared and mixing time of order L squared over L squared log L. So what you can prove for, for the localized phase, so namely lambda larger than 1, is that the gap is at least the free, free gap, but is at most 1 over L. So there is, there is a, a factor L a gap in these in this, uh, inequalities. On the other hand, uh, if you look at mixing time, uh, you can prove that mixing time is bounded below by L squared, and it's bounded above by L squared log L. These, these were done in a paper in collaboration with uh, Fabio Martinelli and Fabio Toninelli. But um, I, w I will give you some, some ideas on how you prove these things. The, the nice thing is that basically you, you take the argument we did before, and you, you believe in it, and push every, everywhere you can to, to, to make it work, and that's what it gives. As far as I know, yeah. As far as I know, these are still the best bound. I will tell you in a moment what the conjectures are for the right things, because here there is something to be said, and here there is something to be said as well. So. Um, what is uh, even more uh, kind of confusing is the uh, delocalized phase. So lambda less than 1. So for lambda less than 1, I won't have time to, to tell you much about this, but there's quite a few stories about these bounds. There is a 5 half popping up here. Namely, you can actually prove that the spectral gap is really smaller than the diffusive spectral gap. It's it's uh, at most L minus 5 over 2. And unfortunately, when you try to prove a lower bound on spectral gap, you, you lose 2 power of L here. We, we lose 2 powers of L. Maybe, maybe you can do better. That's so, so this is uh, something uh, also a bit disappointing. Um, same situation for the mixing time. So you, you lose two powers of L again when you do the upper bound. So here I'm putting little o of ones. Actually, we get a polylogarithmic correction, but it doesn't matter. It, it can be all encoded into this little o of ones in the exponent. So this is uh, something we did uh, uh, with uh, Hubert Lacroix, Fabio Martinelli, Francois Simenaus, and Fabio Toninelli. I can tell you uh, very, very roughly why this 5 half uh, comes up and uh, also why we believe it is the true behavior. So, so this left-hand side should be the right inequalities. And the conjecture is also that this left-hand side should be the right uh, inequalities in the localized phase. And uh, so let me, let me write down this conjecture so you have them clear. So for localized phase, I expect gap to be really 1 over L and not 1 over L squared. But mixing time should be L squared without the log. The delocalized phase should have really this L minus 5 over 2. Mixing time also should be 5 over 2, but I, I, w I would not know what to do with the extra logs and stuff here. So, but let me say uh, quickly why we believe these 
these two things to be the right ones. So the one over L behavior is, is really a, a sort of a new thing in here because one over L square is the typical diffusive behavior. One over L is kind of a, um, uh, more complicated to grasp. The, the, there is a competition here. If you start from maximal configuration, you still take a long time before you see the wall. So this, this model is localized. So think of lambda very large, so extremely localized. But still, it takes really a long time before you see the wall. That's why the mixing time is at least L square. Okay? So your, your system, for a long time, it will see the wall only on the, on the corners. But it's, it takes really a long time before you, you start seeing that. So mixing time should be of order L square. On the other hand, the spectral gap, the, the as exponential asymptotics takes into account not only this, this uh, sort of uh, burn-in behavior, but also some long-term behavior. And this long-term behavior should be dominated by a different phenomenon, which is producing this 1 over L. And maybe I can say something about this. I, I probably don't have time. But it's related to mean curvature uh, relaxation. It's, it's something that uh, uh, one expects also in other situations, such as easing model with plus boundary conditions in two dimensions. But uh, maybe I, I will get to that if, if I have time. Yes? yes? Oh, OK. Yeah, no, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's a good point. Uh, this mean, mean curvature picture that uh, maybe I will have time to, to, to get to, it, it somehow says that uh, there is, in your system, it, there is a, well, you, you have to construct a test function here. And the test function is something that, when you put it in, in front of your measure, creates a measure that, that has a, a, a large probability of a big droplet. So there is something about relaxation of a big droplet that uh, has to do with that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that's also a consequence, yeah. OK, so, so the story of this is that we first proved this upper bound with a test function. But then we found another way to prove a lower bound on the mixing time. And as uh, Yuval says, this one will also imply that, just by the usual uh, uh, comparison uh, relation. Yeah. But, but there is more to this. It's not just that. You can actually construct a test function that gives you some, some ideas on why this should really be the case. On the other hand, the, the 5 over 2, let me be very, very quick about this. So consider the extreme. So, so in the delocalized phase, you, you want to have very, very few zeros. So consider the extreme case where you only have allow one zero. Okay? So this one zero will be somehow the slowest mode of relaxation in your system. Let's, let's pretend we understand that. So, so con concentrate just on the motion of this one zero here. Now, if you concentrate on the motion of this one zero, so basically suppose that you want to bring you know, a large polymer from all the way to the top to all the way to the bottom, something like that. Then you have to bring this one zero, you know, have to make it move all, all around uh, your, your segment. And if you compute the, the effective rates of the random walk of this one zero, of course, it's not an independent uh, Markov chain, this one zero, but you just pretend. So this is heuristic. Then you compute the rates. There is a, this, one zero, this single zero has a small drift towards the endpoints. It doesn't want to be in the middle. This you understand, because you, you have many more uh, configurations that are allowed uh, when you do that. So this small drift uh, is, uh, is on a power law. Uh, it, it's a power law drift. And you, when you compute the birth and death associated to that, you get a spectral gap that is L minus 5 over 2. So it's a computation that gives you this uh, 5 over 2. And it turns out that you can make this into a precise uh, rigorous upper bound. OK? I will tell you maybe a little bit about these proofs. But um, let me quickly uh, say that uh, a, a similar uh, reasoning can be done for the pinning model 
on the wall. This, that's also a very well studied problem uh, in statistical physics because it produces a uh, localization, delocalization transition that is usually called the wetting transition. Here, the, the mechanism is, um, is the following. So in this model, you can easily understand it as follows. So you again have a potential lambda to the number of zeros, and you have a normalizing factor. The normalizing factor, if you, uh, if you think of your polymer and consider all possible reflections of the polymer between consecutive zeros, you get a, a, a simple identity between the two partition functions of the model with the wall and without the wall. So there is a simple way to see that now the, the transition takes place at lambda critical equal to 2 and not equal to 1. So when you have a, a repulsion, it's not sufficient just to give a reward for the zeros. You have to give a large enough reward for the zeros to, to pin the, the polymer. And uh, one way to explain this is by so-called entropic repulsion, because you, your, your system wants to, wants to go up, to fluctuate, because, because you're, you're uh, forbidding to go below zero, so your, your interface wants to grow so that it has more room for fluctuations. And so if you really want to pin it down, you have to give, him a large, uh, give it a large reward. That's, that's an, a, a trivial outcome of these formulas once you accept the phase transition at the free level. So density of pin sites is the same thing as soon as lambda is larger than 2. And the same behavior for the fluctuations hold as soon as lambda is larger than 2. On the other hand, for the relaxation, things are um, slightly different. For the localized phase, we get exactly the same picture as before. So nothing changes here. So I will not describe this. In but for the delocalized phase, situation is different because you don't have this uh, bimodal structure now. So you, you cannot uh, go below zero. So you, you're just going to be a little higher above the wall in the delocalized phase. This will not change dramatically the situation. So you should, be, you should behave more or less as in the free case. And that's what we actually proved. So the delocalized phase is is under control with our estimates because you really have the behavior of the free case. Okay. What is uh, a little trickier is the critical case because now it's not trivial, the critical case. The critical case, we can prove that you have diffusive behavior of spectral gap, but we cannot decide between L square and L square log L for the mixing time. And um, I, I would believe that it's L squared log L, but uh, so the conjectures are again as in as before for the localized phase you accept you expect this one over L behavior and and the mixing time should be L squared at the critical point I would expect L squared log L. So very quickly let me say something about the proof of this. Well, maybe I, I really don't have time to that to do that, but uh, what is nice is that if you're trying to prove an upper bound. For, let's say we, we want to understand the localized phase, okay? And you want to prove an upper bound on the mixing time. Then what is nice is that you can actually use the same argument as before, provided you can prove this upper bound on the expected value of our function phi t that was uh, detecting the relaxation in, in our argument before. So, you have to compute the action of the generator on, on your single variable as before. Now you will get some correction terms that are due to the pinning. Okay? So these correction terms, of course, are active only when your two neighbors are plus one or your two neighbors are minus one. And they have a sign now because lambda is larger than one. So there is a so we're in the localized phase. So this thing is non-negative, this thing is non-negative, and you have a minus sign here. So you have to I, I, I won't do the detail for you, but what you get is that this expression will have, again, a, a sign. So you can actually remove a second term. The only thing is that it will not have a sign uh, point-wise, like in the previous argument. You really have to compute here expect expected values. And the expected values turn out to be uh, well-behaved, provided you use a combination of reversibility and monotonicity. 
And these type of inequalities are a bit surprising at first, maybe, mm, because it's not an obvious consequence of monotonicity. It's, it's, it's truly a combination of monotonicity and reversibility that we were quite surprised to, to be using in the end. So I, I will not do the, the detail here. But um, let me say that, again, the same argument can be used with the wall. It will be a bit harder because now the correction terms involve also repulsion, repulsion and uh, um, so maybe let me say uh, two words about the, the, the 1 over L uh, spectral gap in the localized phase. Why, why that should uh, sort of be connected to some other interesting problems that are uh, well known in statistical physics. Um, situation is the following. Uh, Consider the easing model with plus boundary condition and start with an all minus configuration. This is an old uh, famous problem that has attracted a lot of uh, work and uh, remains uh, largely uh, uh, open. So for those of you who don't know easing model, uh, think, think just of, uh, of uh, like a, an initial profile that is a square and think of uh, uh, dynamics that uh, where you are only allowed to erode uh, corners of this square. And basically, it's, it's, a, it's a relaxation that will take an initially uh, square droplet down to uh, some disappearing uh, droplet uh, in the end. So it's, it's, uh, the minus phase will survive in some droplet that is shrinking. Okay? So the, the relaxation of this system is, is, is uh, related to the shrinking of this droplet. And if you do a toy model, that the, this, this droplet should shrink uh, by a motion by mean curvature. And if you do a toy model for motion by mean curvature that is based on this type of equation, the radius of your uh, droplet should shrink at this rate, as minus 1 over the inverse of its, of its value. And if you do like a birth and death uh, model for the radius based on this type of uh, thing, you will find that spectral gap is exactly 1 over L. So the, 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 the value 1 over L for spectral gap is really associated to, to the shrinking of, uh, of a droplet. But if you do this for the easing model, for the true easing model, so this is a toy model. For the true easing model, things are much, much more complicated. And the best lower bounds known on spectral gap are, are uh, pretty, far away. pretty far away. The best known uh, very recently by uh, Lubetsky, Martinelli, Sly, and Toninelli is, is a quasi-polynomial bound, but not yet polynomial. So this was just to say that the 1 over L is part of a bigger story uh, that, that is still uh, quite interesting. So w w uh, how much time is left, um, 20 minutes? Uh, 20, 20 minutes. Uh, about? Um, 28. I have twi uh, 22. I have 22 minutes? OK, yeah. good. Excellent. So, so uh, now I want to talk about uh, somehow higher, higher dimensional generalization of these models. There's various ways uh, you can generalize these polymer models in uh, higher dimension. I will give you essentially two, two possible ways. And one is the following. Uh, so, so the polymer we have looked at could be seen as a model uh, for sampling uh, walks, on, uh, walks of length L on Z that come back to the origin after L steps, right? Because the set omega L is the set of all walks on Z uh, that come back to the origin after L steps. Now you could do the same with uh, walks on ZD. So consider walks on ZD of length L that come back to the origin after L steps and uh, call omega LD this set here. So these are, every time you take a, you take a, a step which is a unit uh, uh, length in uh, one of the D possible directions, uh, one, uh, 2D possible uh, ways of taking this step, okay? So 
start with the free case and uh, consider the, the free polymer uh, here. And uh, what is the Markov chain? Well, again, the Markov chain is pick a site X. So you can picture this as a directed uh, polymer in, the, in, the, in one direction. It's directed because that's sort of uh, the direction of your path. So it's, it's a directed path that, that has value in ZD. And after L steps, it, 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 it is back to the origin. Okay. Now uh, pick a vertex X and update the value of your path at that uh, point X. So, so again, you have two neighbors at X minus 1 and X plus 1. And you have a set of possible values for the, for the variable at X. This may be forced, because if you have a flat uh, piece, y there's nothing you can do. But if you have two neighbors that are, uh, say, the same, what you could do is replace by uh, 2D possible uh, values the, the height at x. Okay? Or also, you could have uh, an angle and reflect that angle. So there's, there's a. There's a set of possible values at x that you can replace uh, that are compatible with the neighbors. And you just take a uniform choice among them. So as usual, what you're doing is local equilibrium given the neighbors. And you can do this in continuous time. And the generator is always the same. Uh, spectral gap is always the same. Something that we use here to study this problem is log Sobolev constant. I put this up because it has, it has not come up yet, and I'm not sure it will come up in later talks. Um, it's an important tool to study mixing times. And um, if you've never seen this before, there is a nice paper you can read from Percy and Sol of Cost uh, around 20 years ago. It's, it's a good uh, collection of problems on mixing times using uh, log Sobolev inequalities. This is a, um, as you see, it's again a variational principle as in the spectral gap problem, except that here there is no eigenvalues associated to this inequality. It's a, it's a functional inequality that, that uh, it's usually much more challenging than the, than the Poincaré inequality that is associated to the spectral gap. So it's quite a, a, a sophisticated tool. What enters here is the entropy. I will not go into details here. Just that you have, if you have never seen this, it's good to know that there's this kind of tools uh, out there. And uh, if you remember the relation between mixing time and spectral gap, this was the standard relation. You, had, you could lose a factor log of 1 over mu star. The reward for doing a, a, a harder job in proving a log Sobolev constant in the, is that you may lose uh, a better factor here, namely a log log of 1 over uh, mu star. So there are some cases, and this is one of the instances, where I don't know how to prove uh, a sharp estimate without using a logarithmic Sobolev inequality. So I, uh, I think it's interesting that sometimes it's really, uh, at least, is all I can do to prove uh, a sharp estimate. I, I don't know of a, of a coupling argument or any other analytical argument that does not use these functional inequalities here to prove that. So namely, what, what you can prove in this case is that the 1, one plus d-dimensional polymer satisfies, again, the L square log L uh, mixing time bounds, both upper and lower bounds. This we did recently with Julien Soyer. And uh, very quickly, I can tell you that the lower bound uses, again, a variant of uh, Wilson's argument. So you, you cannot use it on the full polymer, but you just look at one coordinate. And one coordinate does not behave uh, well because it's not a Markov chain in itself. But still, you can, you can look at function, linear functions of one coordinate and play with Wilson's argument. And again, the message is that if you, if you manipulate that argument uh, a little bit, you can still get what you want. So it's, it's quite good for that. On the other hand, it's not good for proving an upper bound. At least we were not able, we tried, but we were not able to, 
to get an upper bound uh, using the same argument. Instead, the way we get an upper bound is by using this relation with the uh, log Sobolev constant. So our, our upper bound here is based on proving that the log Sobolev constant <coughs> is at least 1 over L squared up to constants. And uh, this, this requires some work. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's quite technical. But OK. So I want to mention that it's completely open, at least for me, to prove anything if you add a pinning potential here. So I really don't know what to do to get uh, even nice polynomial bounds for the polymer with pinning potential. The, the pinning potential problem is well studied in statistical physics also for this higher dimensional model. So from the point of view of equilibrium, you know everything. There is, there is no, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's there. It's available to, to use. So the problem is really the dynamics. I, I would not know what to do if you, because that's, that's one drawback of this um, uh, log Sobolev constant, these functional inequalities may be very sensitive to, to perturbations. If you add a potential, this, this can break your, your, uh, your nice tools, could, could, could be. OK, so in, in another, uh, another higher dimensional generalization of the polymer model is uh, what is called um, uh, a monotone surface, or dimers, or Lozange tilings. Let, let me show you what, what I mean by all this. Consider, um, I, I will briefly sketch what, what, uh, what we can do for this type of model. But the message is, again, that the kind of arguments that we have seen could be used to prove uh, some interesting results in these cases. So the, um, consider the set of paths that go from 0 uh, to some height h. It doesn't matter. Let's just think of height 0. It, it, it really doesn't matter what height you take. So you may be interested in putting more constraints in this system. Namely, say that your, your path cannot go above a certain given path. Call it a, a roof or a ceiling. And cannot go below a, cert, uh, a certain uh, floor. OK? So you can put some, some paths that add constraints. And now consider a set of uh, k polymers, one on top of another. Let them start at uh, distance one from the other, uh, one from the other. So, so this starts at distance, say, uh, so this starts at zero, say, and this starts at minus one, this at minus two, this at minus three, and so on. Okay? And let them all end at the same height, of course, shifted by, by one. You can add some, some uh, uh, ceiling to everybody and some uh, floor to everybody and ask that they never uh, cross each other. Okay? So these are the set of K polymer configuration. Now it's nice that you can associate it uh, to this system a monotone surface. Namely, if you, if you draw things correctly, you can look at, at that system as a, a stair, uh, I mean, a monotone surface, namely a surface in 2 plus 1 dimension, where you have monotonicity in this direction, namely it can only decrease, uh, or it cannot increase in this direction, and it cannot increase in this direction, you see? I hope you can see it uh, as a three-dimensional object. It's, it's really the same set of uh, polymers we had here. I'm just considering a surface that has this uh, polymers as level lines. So it's a one-to-one -one correspondence, monotone surface to uh, non-overlapping polymers ordered in, uh, in that way. Okay? And you, you may be familiar with this picture. So think of the case where you take exactly L is equal to K. So K polymers and each of length uh, L to K and take the final height at 0. So you have the set of polymers should look like this. OK? You have your, your, L, your uh, k polymers ending all at the same uh, thing and shifted by 1. These are the level uh, lines of this monotone surface. OK? 
this, this you, you should look at it as a three-dimensional object which has level lines given by these polymers, you see? This, okay? And uh, here there is no ceiling and no floor because the ceiling is the maximal one and the floor is the minimal one, so there is no further constraint. Now, this object can be seen as a tessellation of uh, an hexagonal region of the plane in, uh, using losanges, using three types of losanges. You see the yellow, the red, and the blue, and you can, you can use these losanges here. So this would now be a planar uh, picture. And it's, it's well known that this is uh, in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, perfect matchings of uh, the honeycomb lattice uh, in, the, in this hexagonal shape. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, dimers, perfect matchings, uh, losange tilings, monotone surfaces, and polymer, uh, non-overlapping polymers in this way. So let me uh, tell you some known results uh, about these objects. The Markov chain, uh, so, so consider the equilibrium measure is the uniform measure over all such objects. The setting will be that of the previous slide. So just take exactly the hexagonal uh, shape and, and think of this as a monotone surface. Uh, the Markov chain in, in, in the polymer picture, the Markov chain is just exactly the same Markov chain that we have done before. So uh, with rate one, each polymer independently, uh, each vertex of each polymer independently tries to do the updates uh, as we had. And this will converge to the equilibrium measure mu, and uh, you can ask how fast this will converge. And uh, pioneering work was done by Luby Randall and Sinclair in 2000, uh, which uh, introduced uh, some, some, uh, some uh, non-local non moves to, to study this Markov chain, which produced polynomial bounds for the mixing time. So they, they, they proved that this thing mixes in a polynomial time. I will not describe the tower moves because this will take too long, but w one thing that is nice and that is coherent with what we've said so far is that Wilson, in his uh, famous paper that we mentioned several times, actually proved that for this tower move, uh, process, you can give a sharp uh, analysis giving exactly what is the spectral gap and uh, the mixing time uh, up to constants, okay? So this, for, for this non-local move, what is the problem with non-local moves is that, so you would like to prove something about uh, the, the, Elementary moves. Elementary moves are associated to, to removal of these unit cubes or adding of unit cubes, provided you do not violate the, the monotonicity of the interface, of the surface. Okay? And uh, the problem is in tower moves, you are allowed to set down to equilibrium a whole column here. Like take this column and maybe put it down to zero, to, to this minimal height that you can put it to. And same thing for, for uh, you know, this, this two could be go down to zero. And you can imagine in a system where you have very large column, comparing the tower moves to the elementary moves could be a problem. And so comparison bounds only produce uh, uh, some powers, something like L4 log L. But the conjecture is that the true mixing time of the system will be L squared log L again. And the spectral gap should be again diffusive. So even to get L4, so first comparison bounds, we're getting something like L6. But to get L4, we, we use some combination of comparison and censoring that is another technique that um, maybe will, will uh, come up in the next lectures. But, but so far, I think this is the best known bound, L4 uh, to the log L, L to the power 4 log L for, for this system. Conjecture should be the, the diffusive one that is supported by some papers in statistical physics also. 
The problem is that this system uh, displays a, a, a limiting shape phenomenon that, uh, that can be described very roughly as follows. Namely, in the limit, if you rescale your system by L, there is a law of large numbers. And th the, the effect is that you will have some corner, all the corners are, of your hexagon that will be frozen. So there is, um, so what happens is that you may have very large columns in your, in your uh, monotone surface uh, that are associated to positions near, near the, the corners. You see, you can get really large columns here. And the large columns are really bad because you know that this, uh, this uh, tower moves relaxes in diffusive time, but comparing to elementary move, you may have very large difference here. So we were, uh, we were a bit uh, frustrated with this situation. And we wanted to prove something about this, uh, this model. So <coughs> what is nice is that this Wilson analysis works perfectly for the tower moves. That's really magic. Uh, that's, that's really something beautiful uh, uh, about this paper. That, that, that what we wrote for this function f, the linear function we had, you use exactly the same thing, and you get an eigenfunction for the tower moves. So even in this much more uh, complicated setting, the same exact argument works. So we wanted to, 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 to use these kind of things to, to, to analyze the system. So what we ended up studying is a system uh, of monotone surface where you where you have planar, uh, where the equilibrium shape will be typically planar. So think of, uh, one example is this here. So think of a monotone surface where you put these boundary conditions, and here. And now you consider the set of all possible monotone surfaces that uh, are compatible with this boundary condition, OK? So this is, again, a set of polymers, if you want. You can write down all the level lines and look at the polymers and, and study again the same uh, question of uh, mixing time, which, which is associated to, to the same dynamics as before. The dynamics can be interpreted again as adding or removing unit cubes, provided you do not violate the, the monotonicity constraints. And here we can prove a theorem that is almost uh, optimal. We, we get some polylogarithmic correction that I encode in this little o of 1. And you can prove that the mixing time is at least L square um, up to this polylog correction, and at most L square up to this polylog correction. And um, maybe I, I don't have uh, so much time, so maybe just one minute. One minute? One minute? OK, good. So in, in one minute, maybe I can tell you very roughly what the idea here is, because it's connected to what we have done before. So the idea is that um, very, very roughly, I'll put up this, this slide here. Uh, for the upper bound, what you want to do is you want to use uh, this information you have about the, the eigenfunction for the tower moves. So what you do is, is you observe that Suppose you start from a maximal configuration in this triangle we had before. So you, you, can, you have a maximal monotone surfaces, so surface associated to those boundary conditions. And uh, now you want to show that with, uh, within time L square uh, up to log corrections, you go down to essentially flat profile. Because something you know about the equilibrium of this model is that the fluctuations are very, very uh, thin. So, so you have uh, order log L for fluctuations in, at equilibrium. This is an important feature of the planar boundary condition. In the non-planar, you have this Arctic Circle phenomenon. Things are much more complicated. So that's why things work here. Because in the planar boundary condition case, you do have a sort of a, a small fluctuation. So you want to show that this maximal profile converges down to height, to, 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 to <coughs> polylog height uh, in, in, uh, in that time. 
And the idea is to use the, the tower moves, so the, the, the computation you can do for the tower moves, in, uh, in very thin slabs. So you, you can s use a combination of sensoring ideas that um, will, will allow you to dominate your maximal evolution with, with some ad hoc evolution that you can uh, cook up that will mimic so, sort of a mean curvature um, dynamics that, that is somehow the heuristic behind the relaxation here. So I, I, I will not go into these details since there is no time. Let me say that these ideas have been recently generalized by uh, uh, Benoit Lallier and Fabio Toninelli in a nice paper where they uh, are able to do the same kind of analysis for uh, domino tilings. So this is another model of uh, lattice dimers, except that now you don't have the, the honeycomb lattice, you just have the square lattice. And um, they can do the same type of analysis for uh, domino tilings when the boundary conditions are such that the height function is again essentially flat. So the crucial thing here is that the height function should be essentially flat. And uh, as soon as you have this Arctic circle phenomena, things get complicated and you don't control the equilibrium so well. So, so okay, it's a, it's a good, good uh, point to stop, I think. Yeah.